verse 29. Esther 9, verse 29. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihel, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter, letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed to them and as they had decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning matters of the fasting and lamenting. So the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim and it was written in the book. All right, so it wasn't the easiest reading in the world, okay? But still, it's from the book we need to be in this morning, and that is the book of Esther. If you've got a Bible with you, you're going to need to go there to the book of Esther. We're going to be studying on some things because you know that Bible Bowl is coming up, and there's no way to get ready for it unless you really concentrate. And they have already been concentrating because of the things that were said to us by Brother Hetty recently concerning the book of Esther. And I want us to focus on a different part of the book of Esther. And we'd love to have you study that with us this morning. If you have a church bulletin with you, then I kind of vary the way in which I present my materials. Today, the material from this lesson is by and large in a little outline format with little blanks and spaces on it for you to fill in information in the church bulletin. Those of you who are parents have some children that are going to be working on Bible Bowl, then in addition to the mock Bible Bowl later on this afternoon, if you will take this with you today and go home and go over this material, having it fresh in your mind from what we study on today in the Bible text in Esther, then I believe you'll be very well prepared along with that mock Bible Bowl and the preparation you've made for the upcoming trip over to Livingston and for us to show them what we know about the book of Esther. The book of Esther is fascinating, ladies and gentlemen. God is in control even if you don't say anything about Him. Did you know that the book of Esther does not even mention God? Let that sink in with you for a moment. It's in the Bible, and you would think whatever's in the Bible is all about God. It doesn't even mention God. That is such a strange thing for us to hear, and it is such a unique thing for us to mention from Scripture because after, actually God, you know, is not only all over the Bible, but we just take for granted how many times He is mentioned. The Lord spake, saying, and God said to so-and-so, this, that, and the other. You take it for granted. He's going to be all over the Bible. He's not once, not once in Esther. Well, what do you think about that? If you do not see God mentioned in Esther, there has to be a reason for that because it's in the Bible, but He's not in it. But of course, He is in it. It's just that He's not in it overtly mentioned. He's not in it to be front and center and say, hey, I'm going to overwhelm you with my words and with my presence. God is in it, my brethren. God is in it, ladies and gentlemen. We are still religious when we talk about the book of Esther, but you're not religious in the sense of talking about God's big miracles. You mean that God is controlling things and He will do just exactly what He wants to do. When they came and gave Job in the Bible all kinds of bad news, and they said, Job, this happened and that happened, and you know the devil was after him, don't you? Those things that happened to Job were not necessarily individually miraculous but they were a bad string of events. And Job's reaction to that was, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord, which should be our reaction as well, of course, if you're going to have the right attitude. Job knew that God was behind the blessings he received, and Job knew that God was in control of things, even if some otherworldly force or something that he did not fully understand, the devil, was actually behind his persecution. Job knew God is in control. The message of the book of Esther I would like to share with you this morning is that God is in control whether you realize it or appreciate it or not. I want to talk to you about that for just a moment. God will take care of things the way He wants to. And sometimes we feel sad and yet you understand it must be what God wanted out of this situation. Just this past week, 
I had been visiting with somebody. Brother Tuck, I think I mentioned this situation to you or, or one of the other elders about the lady that had pancreatic cancer and I had to go see them, wanted to talk to them. I don't know if it's you or maybe one of the others. And I said, I, I've got to go talk to them. And I don't know how I'm going to go about doing this. Both of them, I believe, need to be talked to about their soul and about their direction in life. And he was there at the hospital. This is uh, some people I knew from up around uh, Tompkinsville. So she was in the Tompkinsville Hospital, but I didn't know her personally. And as I was talking to uh, this couple, then I realized by what he described to me in her condition, this is not good. People don't have a big, long lifespan after that particular kind of cancer. Now, you might find an exception somewhere, but generally speaking, it's not all that long, usually about, you know, several months is what you're looking at. And so she's there in the hospital, and she was talking about at least temporarily getting out for a little while, and we had a good visit. She seemed to be doing well enough. I made plans. I said, I'm going to go back in a few days and told myself I will talk to her and to him very seriously on that occasion. I've just now met her, and when I go back, I'm just going to pray about this and then go right on into it and say what i got to say. Normally, you'd want a Bible study, wouldn't you? You'd want to plan things out. There's no time. I've got to do this now. She has a very grave illness. I arrived just this past week back up in Tompkinsville. I thought I'll take care of some bank business do some things in town, and then I'll run over there to that hospital, and I'll see her. I had his phone number. I called the man up, and I was wondering, if, if, would it be good now if I could come over? Are y'all at home, or are you in the hospital? I'd like to come and talk to you. And he told me, he said, she has died. And I thought, oh my, how sudden. I'm so sorry to ask you about this uh, over the phone or to receive this news. At that very moment, he was still over at the funeral home. And I went over and saw him over there. I'm supposed to do the funeral this coming Friday. What am I supposed to say to him? What am I supposed to say to the family that comes in? It's a situation where you thought you had more time. I thought, well, I can do this. And I thought I was kind of proud of myself. I thought, well, Tim, you're on this. You're not wasting time on this one. You're going to get right back with her while you can and talk to him and her and maybe, maybe minister to them, do something good. There's no time. I can't help that. can't help her. Now, who determines the bounds of our habitation? God does, doesn't He? Who determines the chances and opportunities we have in this life and what it is we can accomplish? God does. Now, I, had, I was having a bad day after I heard that. But what am I supposed to do? As the day went on, I was able to put it from my mind. And I tell you what, it's not that I don't care about people, although my mind is kind of flighty. Anybody can tell you that. But at the same time, it's that I knew if this wasn't the way it was going to be, that God didn't allow it to be, then it wouldn't be that way. God will determine the bounds of our habitation, that is, when you are born, when you're going to die. God will determine if He wants to intervene, how He intervenes, with whom He intervenes, and causes them to live or to pass on and to go on to their destiny. Every single person is within the hollow of His hand and the control of our Lord on high. And every single soul will answer individually before God for the decisions that they make. Now, what is God going to do? He's going to do whatever He desires, ladies and gentlemen. There is such a thing as the rulership, the sovereignty of God. And we try to ignore that sometimes, and we try to act like God can't do anything He wants to. God can do anything He wants to, any way He wants to do it. It's just that God has told us in some cases how He wanted to do it. It's just that God has told us, I'm not going to be restricted by doing it through you. Sometimes I'll do it in a different way. If God says, I am going to do it, but I'm going to give this person a spiritual gift so that it's done through them, 
then man sees it and we say, hey, a miracle, don't we? We say they got a spiritual gift and they did that by the miracle of God. My friends, that doesn't happen anymore. You say, well, I just got, you just got through saying God does anything He wants. He does do anything He wants. But He said, I'm going to do it for a while through people so that they can confirm the Word of God. I'm finished with that now. Now I'm going to do it. And you say, well, then how do you know if it's a miracle if God isn't doing it through the spiritual gifts anymore? Well, my friends, a miracle was where when something happens that God did, you saw that God did it in a way that He doesn't usually do it. He changed the way He usually does it. Some people try to really get picky and define a miracle. That's kind of hard to do. Let me tell you why. And I'll get back to the text in Esther in just a second and tell you how this all goes into Esther. But I want it to be something that lives with you this morning, something that you can take with you this morning to say beyond Esther what it's all about. God was making Esther to be successful. God was making those people, the Jews, to survive a very hard time. God was causing King Ahasuerus to know that he needed to save these people in his kingdom. God was making it to where everything was going to work out, but he did it without a miracle. What is a miracle then? Well, God didn't do it like he normally does it. You don't float away off this earth. You got gravity, don't you? My friends, who establishes and maintains gravity? God does. The Bible directly says that God determines the bounds of the sea and of the land, does He not? And maintains this earth. I know God does that. I don't have to wonder about it, and I don't have to think, well, how does God do that? I don't care how God does it, because it's beyond me. I know He does it. The only reason we're not inundated by some great tsunami right now is because God doesn't want it to happen. And He makes it to where it won't happen, and the sea goes where God wants it to go, and the earth remains where God wants it to remain. And if a volcano goes off, it's because God allowed it. And everything will happen according to His good will. But volcanoes go off all the time. We know how that happens. The sea has the, wa the waves come in, the tide comes in, the tide goes out. We know how that happens. Whatever God does regularly, we don't call it a miracle because it's around us all the time. But when God does something outside of how He usually does it, then we say, oh, I see a miracle, especially when it's done through a person. Let me give you a classic example. In the New Testament, the Bible talks to us about in Matthew chapter 12 where Jesus was going around and people were possessed with devils. They were blind and dumb. And it says that he healed them, Matthew 12 and verse 22, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw, and all the people were amazed. Well, have you never seen anybody have a cataract surgery before and they couldn't see, now they can see? You don't call that a miracle, do you? And yet those who were not able to see now see. What's the difference? This one's a miracle. It's done through a person, Jesus Christ in this case, and it's not the way you would expect it to be done. God did it. Did God give a blessing when that person got healed from their cataracts? He most definitely did. Who blessed the hands of that surgeon? God did. If you don't believe that, you need to quit praying for all these sick people. Who blessed that individual so that they were able to heal successfully? God did. You don't believe that Ladies and gentlemen, like I said, you need to quit praying for all these people. God gets the honor and glory for that. But He can do it apart from a miracle. He doesn't have to have that miracle. Now when Jesus did this, they all saw it and they were amazed. Why were they amazed? Well, a notable miracle has been done. We see the miracle. But in the case of Esther, mm -mm. it's like what God does all the time. He's just doing things but he's not doing them overtly. He doesn't have to be mentioned even, but he's there. No outright mention of God is given in all the book of Esther. I want you to think about a little reference though in Esther, chapter 3 and verse 4. Esther 3 verse 4. God is not mentioned, but who is mentioned? Jews. Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and they hearkened not unto them, 
they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them he was a Jew. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Mordecai was told when this guy Haman, the bad guy that Brother uh, Hetty was talking to us about, when the bad guy comes along, you are supposed to bow, you're supposed to do obeisance unto him. I'm not going to do that. Well, Mordecai, what's wrong with you? This is the way the king wants it. He's second in command now. He's over the princes. You better do what he says. Well, yeah, but I'm not going to give him that kind of an honor. Yeah, but why? Well, you've got to understand, I'm a Jew. He didn't say anything about God, did he? Well, I'm, I'm a Jew. We don't do that. You're a Jew. Well, what's that got to... The Bible doesn't say. It stops right there. It just says, he's a Jew. God is implied that he doesn't do it because of his principles, but God is not mentioned. Esther chapter 4, verse 16. Esther 4, verse 16, a passage we'll come back to just shortly. Gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan. Now, Shushan was the palace, the capital of the kingdom. And fast for me, neither drink three days, night or day, and I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so I will go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. The king held out the scepter. He was a busy man. You didn't just walk into the presence of the king. I don't care who you are. And if you don't get the scepter held out to you, then that's it for you, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. Esther had not been called to come in before the king. She's going to have to barge in. What's going to happen to her? She doesn't know. What does she say to do? She says, you all better call a fast. You call a fast. Now, what good does it do for her or Mordecai or any of those Jews to not eat? You don't eat for three days. What good is that going to do as far as her coming into the presence of the king? It's not going to do any good at all without prayer, is it? Not a lick of good. Fasting implies prayer. If you're not going to have prayer in your life, there's no reason to go into a fast. Oh, somebody might go into a fast to lose weight, but Esther doesn't say, hey, everybody, let's go on the, you know, the South Beach diet because I've got to go in before King Ahasuerus. <laughs> no, that's not what it's about. It's about prayer. Prayer is not mentioned, but it's there. Esther 4, verse 16. The miracles of God are not mentioned, but God is there doing His work through the care that He offers to the world. Somebody says, Tim, oh, you mean providence. You call it what you want. Here's the reason why I avoid that word providence. Did you know that the Bible never mentions God's providence? Never. The King James mentions the word once, and it is not applied to God. It is applied to a man, the king, okay? That word is not applied to God. We coin the word. We use the term... And if people want to use it, it doesn't particularly bother me as long as you don't let yourself get confused by the Word. We're talking about God's care for His creation, His people. God is there doing things. People say providence and they act like they can have a deistic God that went out there and wound up the world and not doing anything. That's not true. God is here for us. He is active. He is powerful. And He is implied in every little thing that you do. He gives me purpose in life. He is the reason why I might fast. He is the reason why I might call myself by name like Christian. God is the one who superintends not only our daily lives, but He is the one who gives us motivation to accomplish great things. Esther said, I'm going to go out there and appear before the king. It's not lawful for somebody to just barge in on the king. He has to invite them. If he doesn't hold out the scepter, then they get the whack but I'm going to do it. I'm going in there. My people need me. If I perish, I perish. What causes Esther to be so brave? It's because she knows I have a purpose to fulfill my God's design in my life. She doesn't say so, but He's behind it. Is God behind all that you do? Are you looking for His providential care over your life? Are you trusting in Him to take care of you? My friends, that's what motivates us. Let me give you this other little thing outside the book of Esther, and then we'll finish by just looking at the book of Esther and things that happened within it, okay? The providential so-called care of God. Let's think about it. 
you pray to God, what do you expect God to do? You expect God to answer that prayer. I know God answers prayer. Now, sometimes Tim McHenry, looking back on his life, sees that he prayed about something that was, looking back on it, kind of silly. Y'all ever prayed about something and then you thought later on, how immature was that? I've prayed things before out of anger. Lord, forgive me. It's been a long time since I prayed something out of anger, but I have before. I've prayed unto God about matters that looking back on them didn't amount to a hill of beans. It doesn't matter if God gives me this or that or if God blesses me to understand this or that. All I needed to know was His Word. All I needed to understand was how to be good. And sometimes I catch myself and I'll pray about things and come back on it and, Lord, I, I'm not saying that God cannot hear anything that we're concerned about, but sometimes I really think that uh, you know, I've wasted divine time. You know what I'm talking about? In my prayers. But I know that prayer itself is not wasted. I know that when I pray to God, there are results. God may have looked at my prayer and said, Tim, that's immature. No, that's his answer. God looks at other things I've asked for and he said, yes, you needed a different direction in life. You can say whatever you want. But I have a right to thank God that I'm here preaching before you all at the Willette Church of Christ. I was not developing as a Christian, as a person, like I needed to. I needed you all. And no, I didn't come in front of the elders and just say, please, please, please. <laughs> I didn't do that. They would have thought I was a weirdo anyway. But I knew it. I knew it inside of me. I had already told myself, and I had confided in certain other individuals, something's got to happen. It wasn't any problem with the people of Monroe County or anything. It wasn't it. It was Tim. I needed a blessing from the Lord. And so the Lord provided. It just seemed to fall right into place. How many times have you seen that in your own life? You see the blessings of God, and yet we don't turn around and give Him thanks. Folks, God does not have to do it by miracle. In 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1, Elijah prayed to God. How do you get something done? You pray to Him, and God answers your prayer. Sometimes He says, yes. Therefore, get busy with those prayers. I had mentioned before we have the prayer uh, list, you know, that we publish. I had it right down there on the pew. But anyway, that prayer list is too full. We need to pray it down. How do you do that? You go to God with it. What was the purpose of the fastings of Esther 4, verse 16? The purpose is in prayer. That's what you spend your time on while you're not busy eating. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42. Elijah had said it's not going to rain, 1 Kings 17, and then in 1 Kings 18, beginning in verse 42, the Bible explains, Elijah went and he prayed to God. When he bowed himself in prayer unto God, then he had people check it out. What's going on? And the guy came back and said, there's a little cloud out in the west. How does a storm normally come in? You see a little cloud out in the horizon, don't you? On the west. And then the wind keeps blowing, and those clouds come on in, and it gets bigger and bigger. And sure enough, Elijah knows. God has answered my prayer. Did he use a miracle, Elijah? Not at all. He did what I asked him to do, and the rain came. Anything miraculous about rain coming? Not at all. But God answered the prayer. He does what he wants to do. And the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men, Daniel chapter 4, is part of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, the book of Esther. Why? Because it teaches the care of God for his people. It teaches the preservation of the Jews under the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It teaches, ladies and gentlemen, how the Jews came to practice to this very day the celebration of Purim, wherein by various fasts and feasts and things of this nature, they celebrate the victory of the Jews over their enemies in the days of King Ahasuerus and of the great kingdom over there around Persia. What happened? In chapter 2 and 3, we find that Esther had somebody in her family, an older cousin by the name of Mordecai. 
he is in a position where he just happens to be in the right place to hear about and to foil an assassination attempt on the king. Now, I want us to talk about that for just a second. This is chapters 2 and 3 in Esther, if you're in the book. Instead of reading those chapters, because then we'd be there all morning, Mordecai foils an assassination attempt. Now, of all the people that could overhear an assassination attempt on the king, who is it gets to hear it? Mordecai. Why did he get to hear it? Somebody says, well, he just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I know I use those words, and those words are very, very wrong. He just happens to be. Just happens. The king later on is going to have a dream. He's going to dream about somebody helping him back when Mordecai foiled that assassination attempt. He just happens to dream back when everything's coming to pass, and he's, he's just happening to remember that somebody saved him from an assassination. No. Esther comes in to appear before the king. He may be upset with her. He may say, that's just it with you. I've got a lot of women I could pick from. I didn't call for you. What are you doing here? He just happens to hold out his scepter and receive the queen? No. Everything that was happening, ladies and gentlemen, did not just happen. Why, it just so happened. When I came by, I got a good deal the other day on a so-and-so. Well, maybe you did. But I'll tell you this much, if God didn't want you to get a good deal on it, you wouldn't have got a good deal, would you? You think about that for a moment. God rules in the kingdom of men. Every good thing you get, folks, if it was good for you and it is good, it is something you need to thank God for. We take God and we shove Him way out there in the universe and say He's blessing out on Alpha Centauri, but every now and then He just might happen to come and deign to do something special on this earth, and if He didn't do it by a miracle, He didn't do it. My friends, anything else is further. Nothing could be further from the truth. That's as far out as you can get. God is active. He is powerful. And if you got a blessing, it is by His power. Listen to this, James chapter 1. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and descendeth from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation nor shadow cast by turning. God is good any way you look at Him. And if you got something good, it's because it came from on high. You get down on your knees and you thank God. Why is it people talk about the miracle of birth? And we argue with people and say, oh, that's not a miracle. I know what you're talking about. No, it's not. But, but, who blessed the world with babies? Old people say, God did. My friends, that means if you've got one, God blessed you with your baby. It's not just some generic out there. God gives the world babies in general. He blessed you with yours. You get on your knees and thank God. You see what I'm getting at? That's why these Jews celebrated this so much and called it Purim, the celebration of the Jews to this very day. Because they knew, even if I didn't see God do it, even if He didn't use a miraculous gift to do it, God did it. I got something good, that's from the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Just like when Elijah prayed, God did it, even though it came in the regular way that rain always comes. Let's go back to the book of Esther again. Traveling down a little bit further, Esther teaches us so many different things. When the people of God were off into captivity, God was going to preserve them under the coming of Jesus Christ. As time went on, there was a bad guy, which we studied on previously. If you were not here to hear that, then his name was Haman. Haman was the son of Hamedatha. All kinds of weird names people had back then. They'd probably think our names are weird. By the way, the guys that tried to kill King Ahasuerus, their names were Bigthan and Tirish. I think that Bigthan was probably like the Bubba of the ancient world, don't you think? You know, you, <clears throat> yeah, we, we want to go out mudding. Who are you going to call? Everybody knows Bubba's good to call for that. Well, back then, I bet it was Bigthan. Yeah, we're, we're going to dig a ditch. Well, ain't nobody stronger and better at it than Bigthan. Let's call old Bigthan. We'll get him out here. I bet Bigthan was the Bubba of the ancient world. But anyway... Bigthan and Teresh, they were going to do some bad things to King Ahasuerus, and Mordecai found it out. He foiled the plot. Haman, the bad guy, doesn't appreciate Mordecai at all. He doesn't just hate him, he hates every Jew. And he was the son of Hamedatha. And he's going to make it to where Mordecai gets strung up. He's going to build some gallows, 
and they're going to chop Mordecai's head off or they're going to string him up, whatever it is that needs to be done. He's going to get rid of that ornery old Mordecai. Mordecai won't bow down to me. Mordecai won't do this. Mordecai, he hates the Jews. And then what happens is, is that he jumps the gun in chapter 5 and Haman has these gallows built on the assumption that he's going to hang Mordecai there. Evil people assume stuff all the time. I assume I'm going to live until tomorrow. You don't have any guarantee of the next moment, do you? Not a bit. Evil people assume. I assume there's going to be a loophole on the judgment day. There will be no loopholes. God will judge according to His word. There is one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken. The same will judge him in the last day. The designation of God's judgment, John chapter 12, verse 48, will not be countersayed by man. You cannot go against it. You can't do anything to get out of it. Every soul shall appear before God, and on that day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. My friends, there's no way to get out of things or to assume that you're going to fool God. Godly people confidently expect the blessings of the Lord with a humble attitude. That's what you see with Mordecai. That's what you see with Esther. In chapter 6, the king just happens to read of the loyalty of Mordecai and how he thwarted the plans of Big Thun and Tiresh. He just happens to read it. He just happens to be disturbed in his sleep. All these things just happen because God wanted them to happen that way. The key part of the book of Esther, though, is back in chapter 4. I want to do a little bit of reading with you, and then the lesson is going to be yours. They told Mordecai Esther's words. Esther's worried about going before the king. And here's what the fellow that raised her and her uh, guide tells her. Mordecai said to Esther, she said, Do not think in your heart that you're going to escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. You think this is going to pass you by? You're not going to get out of judgment. You're not going to get out of bad things happening. You're not going to get out of this situation. If you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Mordecai, how can you say that? It's because he's got faith, my friends. A great man of faith. He knows God rules and God will make it to where somehow he preserves his people under the coming of the Messiah. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You were put here for this reason, Esther. It's your time to act. You were put here because this is your hour, Esther. Strike while the iron is hot. Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. And here's where she gave that statement again in verse 16. She said, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan the palace. Fast for me, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and I'll go into the king, which is against the law. If I perish, I perish. Esther, in this case, showed great preparation. I will prepare myself, even though she doesn't say so, before my God. And in prayer and fasting. That's why you fast, folks. God left off the prayer part there on purpose. He's showing you that God works behind the scenes. And I will prepare myself to do what I must. She showed great courage. This could mean her immediate death. Mordecai assured her that she would not avoid the trouble, but still the fact is, is that maybe she could put it off. But this is her immediate death if the king does not hold out the scepter and receive her. She showed great wisdom. Who else is going to do this if I don't do it? I have a way to do this. Let us prepare ourselves. And when I go in before the king, I'm going to have a plan. She executed her plan perfectly. Esther showed great preparation, great courage, great wisdom. What an incredible queen. The king, ladies and gentlemen, held out the scepter. The king received her and listened to her petition. The king understood, I should pay attention to this woman. As he paid attention to her, things turned against old Haman. And that wicked Haman, even his wife in chapter 6 and verse 13, saw that, uh, you know, it's, it's gone against you now. You're going to have a hard time, old boy. She wasn't very encouraging, was she? <laughs> but anyway, it went against him all right. 
Haman ended up being hanged on the gallows he had built for Mordecai. The Jews instituted the great feast at the salvation of their people from all the destruction that was planned to be brought upon them by Haman. Mordecai was raised to great preeminence in the kingdom to serve King Ahasuerus. Queen Esther lived and proclaimed the feast of Purim and spread word throughout all the Jews and the land of the empire. Everything worked out great for the preservation of the Jews under the coming of Jesus. My friends, the message of the book of Esther is that everything is going to work out great for you under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ the second time. If you will prepare yourself, if you will act with courage, if you will have the wisdom to see that you need to obey the gospel this morning. Esther knew what she needed to do. Do you know what you need to do? Believing on Jesus Christ, will you repent of your sins? If you know you need to repent, then do you know that you need to confess? If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you is the basic message of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10. But if you confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, then that's for your salvation. My friend, do you know what you need to do? Oh, I'm not ashamed of Jesus, somebody says. I want to do what's good. Well, God has commanded you to be baptized into Christ. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Why put off the commandment of God? Do what He said. Receive the blessing of salvation and then live faithfully for Him. If there's any way we can help you to do that this morning, come unto the Lord. Serve Him faithfully like Mordecai and Esther, but serve, them, serve Him under Jesus Christ our Lord who will save you, take all your sins away, and He'll do that right now. You'll just come as we stand and sing.